Hello, everybody. I think we can get started now. Welcome to today's ISTD live event with Ariane Spanier. You can see on the screen. I'm briefly going to introduce myself. I'm Astrid Stavro, president of ISTD and vice president creative director at Collins. And this talk is a part of a series of live events from ISTD. Keep an eye on social media for the exciting forthcoming talks that we have lined up. And in the events page on ISTD's website, there is an archive of previous links that you can look into as well. Before I introduce Ariane, just a few words about ISTD and who we are. We're a professional body run by and for typographers, graphic designers, and educators. We have an international membership and aim to create and inspire interest in all forms of the typographic practice. You can find out more in ISDD's website. And also a very quick thank you to the team behind the event for hiding behind the screens. You know who you are and thank you so much for making today happen. So uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce the one and only wonderful and formidable Berlin-based graphic designer, Ariane Spanier. And thank you so much for joining us today, Ariane. It's a real pleasure. Uh, Ariane is, as many of you know, is an internationally acclaimed graphic designer known for her playful approach to typography and her manipulation of type and texture by hands. Working primarily in art and culture, she specializes in both digital and print. Her experimental and innovative approach comes through in everything she does. Ariane will talk about her love of typography, running an independent magazine, why hard, hard work doesn't have to be necessarily serious, and why she does what she does. And having said this, over to, over to you, Ariane. Thank you for the lovely introduction and um, the invitation to this, uh, this talk. And I think I'll jump right in and try to share my screen, which hopefully just works as it should. All right. You should all see just a book. Oh, that's maybe not, that's myself up there. So you should all see a black square or a black rectangle. I think uh, then we are all set. Yes. So. Why? Let me, it's just jumping around here. I have to get out one more time. Something is wrong here. I just stop this, but I come right back. Um, so, all right, let's do this again, because no talk without any kind of little technical interruption. So. Oh, and just to remind everyone, if yeah. you have any questions, please put them on the chat while Ariane is talking, and we'll have a, a Q&A session at, at the end of Ariane's talk. All right. So, yeah, why? I, I wanted to start with a why because it's actually a, a mystery that I ended up working um, with type uh, or with typography so much uh, because when I was in design school, um, typography was that thing you had to do well, um, you had to do it correctly, and type design to me was all callig calligraphy, photographer, uh, font lab. Um, and I thought you had to know everything about baselines or kerning pairs, and I couldn't really find the joy in it because I thought in type design you had to do things meticulously right, and well, you kind of have to, um, and that I would never become a pro uh, in this, and um, yeah, that it's basically just taking too long, and at the time, there was a whole basement in our art school filled with a letterpress machine and letter sets. And I think it's fair to say that I was very ignorant uh, to it, but it was also, you know, the beginning of the 2000s and Power Max G4 were what was really important and 80 gigabytes of disk spacement. Uh, basically you were set uh, forever um, with enough space. Um, for all your work you would do on the computer. 
So when I was 25 years old, uh, I was interning um, at Stefan Zagmeister studio in, in New York and was allowed to mess with the whole fashion collection by the, the means of destroying the clothes um, to create words out of them. Um, and, and somehow then something clicked. And um, I think this set a tone. It was like, I started to find a trace of what I was looking for. And like, to, to me personally, it felt like a light had finally been switched on something that was kind of in the air and that I was interested in, but I could never really formulate it myself. And ever since I find myself um, using type as a, as a vehicle as much as I can. Often I get a feeling though that a design isn't fully there if it you know, doesn't entail a good part of nice and expressive typography. And by nice, I possibly mean ugly too. Um, but whether this be, you know, tests that never see the light of day or, um, or posters that um, are so full of stories um, written, written on it that you have to uh, to only to zoom in to see anything um, on it only way you can see you know figure out the little texts uh, in this case on levitation white light or near-death experiences or uh, ufos um still i have to wait for this transition to happen ah, I, I i just encountered really lovely animations on keynote but they take their time i also keep thinking typographic design is a way to cheat yourself to life as a graphic designer um because it's the most easy thing to do you always have a container of form uh, you got meaning and then you just play around with these tools but sometimes words, letters, language uh, are too sharp or too precise and too defining. Sometimes you only want to evoke emotion, atmosphere, and maybe, I don't know, this unsettling feeling uh, like, like here for the Yokohama Triennial, Triennial of Art, where uh, blue nuclear glows and little missing pixels disrupt an otherwise beautiful gradient color flow. So. As a designer, one should keep always that sense of what fits to a theme and what brings it out in the best way. And um, that may not always be your most used way of expression in design. Um, turbo, it's like, and over time, for me, emotion started to play turbo, an ever like, more important role. Um, just turbo, because like, the world has changed, technology, to, technology and communication has turbo, changed. Like, and there's this extra behavior at our hands to show type and time, and it adds another layer of impact, of meaning, um, of understanding. Um, but often, so nowadays, I often jumping back, um, back and forth, basically, between analog and physical design processes um, and entirely digital workflows, uh, partly to have a change, to alter my perspective and my outcomes. Um, and yeah, however, most of the time I do spend at the computer uh, getting lost in drawing, um, trying to be as intuitive as possible, shaping letters. I would start out with these kind of bumpy, blobby shapes and they just come to me. It's really just a drawing, I think. And, and then sometimes, you know, things take turns for better or for worse and uh, the title changes in between a job and you have to do it all over again and the contrast gets lost. And then at some point I would just say, you know, stop, it's finished. And I always like green better anyway. And maybe just enough time has passed and I consider it done. Sometimes that's all the magic that's, uh, that's in there. Mm, and I was hesitating in the beginning to design typographic posters just at the computer, you know, because this seemed too simple and too easy to make, mostly, um, you know, trying to make it beautiful without without ever getting up from your chair. It's like cheating. Um, so there's always this important balance to find, um, to figure out what, what makes sense, what relates to a topic, but also, you know, can stay a little bit 
free from that, from the topic, um, to keep this li uh, layer of, of awkwardness maybe in it too, um, and which process is right to choose for a certain job. Mm. Oh my God, I hope it didn't crash. Let's see, I don't think so. I can get sucked up into making for days sometimes. Um, I wanted to include a gold foil to a poster that only had a tiny number of copies. And I couldn't think of any other way to have the gold applied because it was a fairly regular, bigger poster size, uh, other than gilding it myself by hand with gold leaf. And yeah, sometimes I really wish I'd be smarter to find different solutions. So I was supposed to make five posters. I mean, what, what kind of number is, is five? And I gave up at three and I kept one bad copy to myself. So the hilarious mix of techniques turned out to be a digitally printed poster hand gilded with gold leaf. Um, that's, that's sometimes how things go and they don't make sense. And I, I don't even know what to think of it afterwards, but um, I don't know. It's just, I think all part of a process that uh, that um, we go through, or I definitely go through as a designer, um, again, mixing um, all kinds of ways of working. And yes, I think it's still worthy to get away from the screen to involve other processes, to invite elements of chance into the work. Um, a joyful process opens the doors the or the door for ideas um, can work like a trigger. Uh, you can reach results that are unexpected. Um, and I think these are the best, even in this case here, if they aren't real letters. Um, ideally, there is a flow happening in the process uh, where you can hardly stop making, writing or drawing. Um, during the pandemic, for instance, uh, during these years, I collected absurd uh, COVID-related news headlines from all over the world that really told so much about the, the cluelessness of our societies. Um, and I drew them with color pencils using a very slow process that reflected the boredom I felt at times. Uh, I think which always mixed with stress. So uh, this stress, for the mix was kind of the pandemic feeling uh, for me. And yeah, these news uh, were incredible. Like Germans should celebrate uh, Easter like Christmas or the Islamic state issues a travel warning for Europe. Um, and yay, yeast is available in supermarkets again. And I have to ask, should I snitch on my neighbors? So it was, it was really, um, telling and revealing and I, that that's a kind of a project one could basically continue forever i think um if there would be the time and if there's no pandemic there's no time um i love to design cookbooks especially when i can use handwriting uh throughout a whole book but above all this one uh, was a book about the friendship of two chefs who run two restaurants together in new york city and um, I think that's something that's very rare because culinary chefs tend to be egomaniacs and uh, to be able to work together and agree on menus seemed like an extraordinary achievement and uh, a proof of real friendship. Um, yeah, and to contribute to that story with this rough handwriting was fun, but uh, also I hadn't found out a way to make a really proper irregular typeface, handwriting typeface myself. Uh, at that point, so I wrote everything with brush and ink and I scanned it. So it's all really analog done. Um, but who would have known that uh, recipes are a joy to typeset? I mean, that is more a question to myself because I wouldn't have known. Um, but yeah, marking old ingredients in bold so impatient people would easily find them. Um, but the biggest advantage to design cookbooks is to give them to friends uh, as gifts because they feel pressured to invite me over to dinner um, to cook from it. So that's one of the bigger reasons I think to do cookbooks. And yeah, sometimes the only goal can be to make something overly complicated too, just to prove it is possible um, in the end. And sometimes I go as minimal as I can. A book cover doesn't need much at times because you can draw with type as well. It can become a chair, uh, 
or it can just be bold. It can be delicate, open and a little bit mysterious. And uh, yeah, it can just pop um, or it can be really tiny. So I think all this um, producing and messing and moving and finding and writing and designing and yeah, basically going back and forth is tied together by an inner compass for expression of voice uh, and uh, yeah, an acknowledgement basically that um, yeah, typography as image uh, and as a carrier for, for, for messages, for illustration um, works also as a process of motion or in motion, but also I think it works as that baseline to me that I hated to learn about in the first place. So I always wanted to use type in a more spatial and in a larger setting. And be, that's, that's mostly because typography to me is not something that should be restrained to a book or to a post. And um, I think once type appears on different surfaces, it seems like, you know, a room or a wall or an object gets to speak, like a ghost's voice is made visible uh, that was all along uh, there in the, in the ether. And uh, I got the chance last year, and for the first time I worked for a client um, from the city I grew up in, uh, which is Weimar, um, a small town which I have left 24 years ago um, to, to go to Berlin. And uh, Weimar is a beautiful little town in the middle of Germany. Uh, it's heavy on cultural heritage. Um, German writers, thinkers, musicians, and poets uh, have resided there. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the author of Faust, being one of the most prominent figures from that um, 18th, 19th century um, that this uh, era, the city feeds on. Friedrich Nietzsche uh, is one of those guys who stayed there and wrote there, and Friedrich Schiller as well. So the Bauhaus was founded in Weimar too, before it moved to Dessau, something that not many people know. And also some darker periods of German history played out there too, uh, that most visitors of the town aren't so aware of. So the biggest foundation um, in Weimar that keeps and archives classical literature and art um, asked me to come up with a design for their year of language or year on language. And together with an exhibition design studio and the foundation, we conceptualized a series of public sculptures that were really heavily dressed in type. Um, we wanted to use quotes and writings by the authors that related to contemporary issues like truth, power, language, love, politics, and, and, and all these kinds of human sensitivities. And, and many of these authors have written about exactly that just that they were you know like 200 or 300 years old and um, the guy you see here uh, was not a writer but in fact is um is justus erich walbaum uh, who was a type cutter and who lived in weimar in the city of weimar in the 19th century and his typeface walbaum was a german answer to this classicist dido family so yeah, for me, it was no, it, obviously a no brainer to, to use this uh, typeface for the whole project. And the room you saw before was an entire room um, filled with poems by Goethe, including floors and, or the floor and, and the bench for sitting. And uh, there were poems uh, in the room that were also, you know, explained in some brochures and uh, they were looked at and revisited a little bit different because like basically what they're saying is uh, sometimes different uh, than what we thought uh, for for many years and how how it often is with, with older writings uh, when they get revisited, um, new meanings appear. So there's one, one uh, here, it's just you see it at the end of the wall, uh, a, a small poem that I learned, everybody in Germany learns as a kid. And it's actually a, a rape poem, um, which is if you really if, if you read it that way, it's totally obvious. But uh, yeah, no one ever did before. 
so yeah, there is uh, there is a lot to find in these old uh, old texts, and often they're very, very smart, and there's there's a lot to learn from. But sometimes, yeah, we we just look at we uh, look at these literature uh, pieces uh, differently now, and here basically you see in the top right corner how how typography is used in the city of Weimar. So you would uh, find these like brownish, red, reddish toned um, quotes on, yeah, on building walls here. And, and that it has always been like that. Um, that's how, how it properly is used in the city. And um, I think these stretched and distorted um, the pieces of text that got added to the city in, in this year, last year, uh, were a kind of new way for the city to, 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 to read its literature. And to, to start out with the whole project was um, together with an exhibition design studio here in Berlin um, to, to find out how to shape these, these sculptures that were later to be uh, standing in the city. And uh, we cut from styrofoam, some some cubes, and then cut it into different pieces, mm, imagining that cube would fall onto the city and explode into smaller pieces that would make the the, the sculptures spreading out um, in the city. So there was a lot of prototyping um, involved in the beginning, and uh, placement and sketches, and uh, a lot of paper modeling. I did with really bad uh, writing, and at the end. It was really um, mysterious. Um, this looks almost like a computer uh, rendering, but it was the real sculptures that were, um, but basically there was a series of nine sculptures, uh, sculpture groups spread throughout the city in front of museums or in walking streets in the town. And um, this would be a quote here reading um, or speaking about the, the power of words, uh, words aren't innocent. Uh, so this was on the topic of use of language in Nazi Germany. So all these nine or eight different uh, sculptural installations and groups got different quotes by different authors on all these different topics. Um, in the museum, there would be an audio station. You could listen to uh, to some some yeah words by linguists and um, there were little numbers on these quotes so people could visitors could follow um, the quote and walk around the sculptures um, and they could also rest on on them so there were a lot of um, you know things to do with with them and kids always find out. Uh, in the first place um, what to do so yeah it became many of them became a playground for kids um, during the year yeah just some shots from the building from the the modeling and um, it wasn't that easy for the people who had to apply all these uh, prints um, and make it really really correctly and it was incredible to see that from these very four models uh, it became an actually installation people could sit on and take photos and um, here we also build in one yeah basically a space around uh, another museum a selfie structure containing words from a historical word list by uh, one of these authors called Wieland uh, he collected funny words uh, a few hundred years ago and they are they're Hard, very hard to translate from one language to the other, but but a rough try would be, uh, or some are like magical sisters or the uh, owl's soul, uh, king of dusk, and 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 so on. So um, some are really intranslatable because they're just specifically German mixed and combinations of words is really just really hard to get. Um, it's well, it is. It was a year on language, and it was. Um, it was the German language, so that is uh, sometimes hard to to get across. But um, yeah, what started out as as little styrofoam cubes um, became sculptures like uh, "We All Sleep on Volcanoes." Here on the right side, a quote by Goethe, um, which is I think something that is very very uh, um, up to date right now. Um, I think that's also a time where we feel like we all sleep on volcanoes and. 
um, a Nietzsche quote uh, was was uh, yeah put on some fence uh, about the question if language is the adequate uh, expression of all realities and uh, yeah writing always invites more writing um there were more installations throughout the year um, that even had a timely um, element to it so they they grew like every month there was a new of these uh, plates um, being installed and yeah in the end there were i don't know like 10 11 of these um i don't even go into detail what they were about it's a bit too uh, long to explain and then there were some posters that I designed um, for people, for visitors to take away. So it was like free posters with, with a few quotes. The first one would be the volcano quote, which I personally really like. Um, something about the forever yesterday, uh, everything that's old and is afraid of today and tomorrow. And the, the last one is something about truth. And basically it's a quote on, yeah, that we just should hear each other out and um, not start to fight about the truth and who owns it and uh yeah well it, i was really surprised i mean i grew up in weimar so i was i was always surrounded by all this literature and when you grow up with something you you stay ignorant as as possibly much as you can to it um because of course everything else is interesting um but i was i was surprised how much and how many of these quotes would would yeah would feel so contemporary uh even though the wording sometimes were a little bit old but um um that was a really uh, really interesting journey for me and these um yeah these were the posters for taking away and, and part of the project was also to to interact uh, or make people interact in the city a little bit with the other part of the design that was you know the, co the visual communication about the whole event the year people could point their phones uh, at the, po the event posters and more of these words would just fly out and um yeah for the end of the exhibition someone brought uh, uh bought a few of the sculptures for their gardens when they were like almost destroyed but they they are enjoying it now and they found a new home and uh yeah i think this is one of these projects where i was just very very happy about the scope of it and um, there is something with bigger type on all kinds of surfaces that is very satisfying but to me also there, there is some mystery in it um because in it changes not only the message message of, of the words that are said um i think it also changes something about the objects the places um the surround surroundings and environments they are uh, placed in so let's get to that type of fun mm, because everything you put out there comes back to you in one way or another um and i hadn't worked in a while uh, with real physical type in the studio um when uh, wise tv asked me to create a 10 second video or a little animation um of their logo so it was a free brief and any uh, you know build up or tiny little story that ends in the with the logo of Weiss. Uh, like you know some of you might remember the old MTV logo animations um, of the good old days. Uh, so it was similar to that the concept. And because Weiss is such a nice little four letter word, I stick to type and I came up with a bunch of rhyming words on Weiss. Um, there are probably a few more, but not all of them made it into the film because 10 seconds is really, really short. And for more than a week, there was a lot of stop motion and filming and the, and the making and the studio turning once again into a mess because that is for some reason very, very easy to do. Um, and so there were tiny motions that I recorded uh, of of the, all kinds of different words that I used in the end. Uh, th this would be uh, cats licking some milk or some cream um and all of this would be really really short um and the, the final video for this which was just really fun to do was this. oh it shuts up again i put it on loop okay let it run one more time because it's just 10 seconds
So this is this is um, these types of little in in between jobs. I think that can actually spice it all up if you are involved in bigger projects. I, I really uh, I really love to to do something and put everything else away uh, and yeah, well turn the studio into a mess um, to do something completely different. Um, I think that is the best way to continue to work because otherwise everything would be just too similar and too, too much of the same. Um, let's come to an important part of, um, of what I'm doing uh, as well. I'm not only a designer, a graphic designer doing like a client, uh, client works, client jobs. Um, I also am the creative director of a magazine for drawing since many years now, actually. Um, and it's the independent Fucht magazine for drawing and was founded in Norway in 1999. Mm, hence the name Fucht, uh, which is a Norwegian name and it means humidity. At the time this magazine started out, there wasn't any comparable periodical magazine on drawing on the market so drawing was still mostly a tool medium uh, it was used for sketches uh, it was not widely accepted as its own valuable art form um, it was born out of the necessity to give um, a drawing a space and an exhibition place in book form basically and it changed over the years um, from an entirely visual magazine to a place where we talk with the artists about their works, ideas, and, and, and love for drawing, basically. And it's a niche magazine um, with a weird name. But for some reason, that's what, what keeps it alive and uh, widely existing interest, uh, I think. Personal connection for people to drawing is is what, what let this magazine run as well. And yeah, drawing is the first human language um, one that we basically speak before we can write and it's an annual magazine and over the years we have featured over 600 artists um, so far and when I became involved in the magazine I decided to only use typography on the covers for the magazine. There are many ways type relates um, to, to drawing. First of all typography is a drawing in itself it can uh, be built out of drawing materials um, as, you know, as in lines or uh, in dots <clears throat> or paper. Um, and here you see a, a cover of the magazine I did many years uh, ago in 2009. It was like cut uh, paper, rolled paper, and it revealed drawings underneath. And for a while, I kept getting these requests um to create yeah the same rolled paper design uh, for other magazines and i always declined um, or denied uh these these requests until the washington post magazine uh came along and sent an email and then i couldn't say no so i recreated this concept once um because it was such a big magazine and it was about remembering the lives of people that had died in that year remembering their stories and achievements and a few years later, someone pointed to me uh, or pointed me towards a magazine cover that looked very close to what I had done for the Washington Post. And I was really angry at first. And I thought about ranting on Instagram uh, when a friend told me, don't do it. It's just bad karma. And I, I realized he's, he's right. My anger will pass. And it's it's not doing you any good uh, to, to be angry and, and the feeling that wave of revenge. It's really just about letting go. And because I think the real harm happens to the one ripping someone's work off and you will never you know, have the satisfaction or that feeling of content of coming up with the, with the idea. It's not yours and it's nothing you can ever be proud of really. And it's not fulfilling in, in any way. And um, yeah, we, you know, designed all kinds of uh, magazines over the years. One, one of the issues was a cover that had little chains attached that complemented parts of the title letters. And when they moved, they would destroy the appearance of the, of the, of the name Fucht, but also uh, reshape the letter shapes um, 
all over again, you know, as in these old toys uh, where you can change the nose of a face. And each cover has different shaped letters after being foil wrapped, shrink wrapped. Uh, so they, they come to lay in, in different positions. And th this one, this issue is maybe for me the ultimate connection, ultimate connection of drawing typography and um, a completely unrelated material as the chain. So um, yeah, that was uh, it process wise interesting to do and production wise interesting to do, um, not without its, its challenges, but um, I was really happy with the result and um, I, I designed a little typeface um, for it um, because after art school at some point I learned how to do that. And at least the, the fun ones. Mm, and yeah, basically just used it in the for for the layouts in the magazine and here. The, yeah, we we always look at all kinds of different ways of drawing, uh, spatial drawings like here with wire, um, catch our attention. So uh, we always we, we love to get surprised um, with the magazine. We hope to surprise also sometimes the the readers and viewers and even audiences enjoying themselves it's proof that something worked out. And sometimes we achieved goals that we didn't know we had. So we got into Playboy's reading corner with our issue on dirty drawings, um, an issue entirely about sexy drawings, uh, which is sold out since a long time. I think it was the one that was sold out the fastest. And this uh, issue um, from a few years back related to the topic of systems, um, so, so the cover was made out of, of, of several paper discs, which breaks and builds up the, the systems literally back uh, back and forth together and uh, like a puzzle game. And uh, it, it's also highlighting a fragile or how fragile systems are um, and how little it takes to destroy them. And um, also here we have uh, each, um, you know, being sold quite uh, a little bit differently um, in the way they are put together. And um, yeah, I think every extra effort also in production pays out at the end. When you see an audience enjoying a playful magazine cover, um, yeah, the reward is even bigger and something has worked out. Um, for, for fun, I would build this also as a little installation or a little sculpture for a party and Mm, what, whatever um, is possible, whatever idea comes ac across or whatever opportunity basically comes by, gets done because the, the magazine is done in-house. Uh, my, my partner in life is uh, the founder of the magazine. So he's the, the, the editor in chief. And yeah, that gives a lot of freedom with this little publication. Um, and yeah, if we don't want to publish, we don't publish. If we delay it, we delay it. Or um, if we, if we um, yeah, but want to put out three in a year, we could do that as well. So it's, it's really just about like what we feel we are capable of in, in the moment it happens. And, and I think that is uh, speaking of independency and independent magazines. Um, uh, to to me personally, a really important aspect because there is no one uh, who ever tells us what to show and who to show. Um, that's the biggest advantage, I think, to work that way. One issue really suitable for uh, for this talk, obviously, would be an issue on writing and drawing because over the years we saw spikes in subjects um, artists would work with because we, we have been doing that since a long time. We, we've, I don't know, published like 20, 22 issues or so, um, so far. And um, so there's a lot of observing of the art world uh, in regarding to drawing. And yeah, then if you just do something for long enough, you, you can see patterns, you can see, um, yeah, topics, themes, people work on, and I think that uh, that got us to to start to to start with themed issues, which we didn't do before. Um, yeah, so we we needed a bit of time to to collect, I think, knowledge about drawing, and this cover was designed entirely of little words and descriptions of uh, yeah what was going on uh, on uh, on the cover, and it was very literal and describing a letter shapes uh, or um, then as well there's always a little bit 
more to a cover. I think there's always these different dimensions um, that you first see. And uh, yeah, it's all about imagination. Um, that's basically what, what, yeah, what, what anything I think a designer does is actually about. Um, and in this issue, we, we showed artists that, that worked with, we, as I said, texts and writing um, and words and letter shapes in their drawings. And um, so they all related heavily on typography in, in one or, or another way. And this artist would uh, cut out all the typography or like the little words and, and letters from the Bible and create mesmerizing patterns with it. Um, we featured the, the mysterious Voynich manuscript, which is 600 years old and it's, uh, or it has not been deciphered until today. So it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's an unknown um, content of the book. And uh, there are many scientists and even artificial um, intelligence trying to work on this to figure out what this is. Uh, but they haven't been successful yet. Um, Chinese, Chinese uh, artist uh, Zhu Bing would draw with, with character landscapes um, and Paula Scheer's uh, newspaper diaries had to be in this issue as well. So yeah, it's like um, we couldn't fit all in we wanted to and uh, this is definitely a potential for a 2.0 issue on writing and drawing and yeah, and for, for this one here, I for this little experiment, I let little robots running through ink drops, uh, messing up letters to see what happens. And sometimes playful experiments lead to uh, or provide uh, provide ideas for issues that um, that come later on. Mm, we decided to give room to chance and surprise in the design process, and we hired these little mice actors for an issue and. They were supposed to move letters, uh, at least that was our intention, and then they were more into eating them, and we let them run to these letter-shaped ink pools, and they dragged their little tails through the ink, and they also, by that, they created some, some drawings. Mm, because we were really happy with these results, we invited them as artists to the issues of these uh, small mice artists, uh, were shown in it as well and that was the cover after all and yeah another issue was on stories and storytelling and it was called the storylines issue and it was on narrative drawings on on sequential drawings and in stories there can be so much hidden that was my idea for this cover at least although the the reference for this cover a uh, design because i think like in stories you have little threads left and right uh leading to other side stories, memories that unfold or uh, are hidden as well. So it was kind of a folding technique for this cover that basically makes different words out of the name of the cover um, than when it's folded together. So there's always this little tiny element of surprise in it, which I really like if I am able to achieve this. Um, it's not always um, that I am. and. Yeah, well, th this is just an index page, which is um, one of the most liked designed pages in the magazine, because that's where design can happen. Usually in the, in this uh, drawing magazine, I leave a lot of space uh, to the drawings and, and don't interfere too much um, with the space for the drawing, except in this issue, I think I uh, I provided a little frame and yeah, as I said, like se sequences were a big topic in this one and um, a Korean artist with very calm uh, travel drawings. Um, they were very quiet with no words. Um, we were still kind of, I, I think, fascinated by the atmosphere in these drawings. And I kind of, I, I almost hear the sounds of these drawings. And um, yeah, we, we interviewed the God of, non-linear storytelling in comics, Chris Ware, uh, who's a master, I think, of playing with time and memory. And he uses a lot of diagrams in his art um, to tell a story. And I came across without being in that field. No, I, I don't know a lot about mangas. And, but, uh, but yeah, this Japanese artist, Yushi Yokoyama, Yokoyama um, 
as neo manga series um, I was really fascinated by because I couldn't really I couldn't really understand them and they were uh, kind of weird to me and and that's kind of what what is exciting I think and um, yeah then we did one issue on faces because faces finally I mean our our issue of uh, yeah the year the last year um, we dedicated to the face because. Yeah, our post-pandemic issue, um, we thought we finally wanted to see faces uncovered. So I think we, yeah, for this, we left the cover empty, kind of empty, um, for everyone to draw their own face. And I think this cover might have been a little exception from my old type rule for the Fuchs magazine covers, but there's still enough writing on it. Um, but I think face beats type after the COVID years. We needed it that instant psychological reaction to another person's face and for, for this one we printed 24 flyers with 24 different drawn faces and they got placed onto the covers um so each each magazine was sold you know with a different face and then it just flew off and and the, the readers uh, and viewers they could draw their own face because they were empty again And yeah, we asked the readers of the magazine to send us back a photo of their copy with their own drawing on the cover. And we received quite a high number um, of these, um, yeah, that, that, um, that the audience did. And I think this interactive element showed us once again how much people love drawing mm, and how much they like to, to interact. But I think also to me, this is, a proof, oh, this is also interesting because people even animated the cover in 3D and sent it to us. Um, I did not ask for that, but uh, I thought it was really cool. And yeah, I think the face is one of the most first or one of the first motives um, we draw as children. And it's the most basic and fundamental thing to draw and the response to this uh, issue clearly showed the interest and impact to drawing has or the impact that drawing has on us as as humans um, as an essential activity uh, so many people uh, love to do and in this faces issue we showed an artist working with drawings that uh, that uh, try to avoid facial recognition software um, to mess with the faces um, faces kind of geometry and we had received many submissions on lockdown drawings because that was clearly a way people spend their time uh, yeah restrained to home to their homes um, so that was the thing they were doing and one artist suffers from the neurological disorder of face blindness uh, she can't rec even recognize her own face in the mirror so she keeps drawing portraits over and over and trying to understand what a face is And we showed Talan Watia from Bangkok, uh, who did watercolor portraits of lost victims from protests in Thailand in 2010. So there are always all kind of um, different aspects we are we are we are going after um, in all our issues of the magazine to get people engaged, um, of course, in all kinds of ways um, with it. Uh, this was definitely the way to go on the faces issue to create some face effect um yeah and it just proved how important drawing is to us once again i want to talk about a last project um a type of anachronism um my first encounter with a North Macedonian capital Skopje was in 2006, so it's many years ago when I designed a poster um, for a art installation uh, of my partner uh, who was doing an artist residency there. So uh, he was exhibiting in Skopje and it was a reason to travel and I did a poster, I designed a poster for him and um, I need to go back a little bit further in time to continue to tell the story because in 1963, a strong earthquake destroyed a large part of Skopje. Um, so Skopje is, is, you know, Northern Macedonia is, is uh, 
one of the Balkan countries, one of the former Yugoslavian countries, in case you were wondering, because I wasn't really sure before I went there the first time either where it was. So yeah, it was like almost 80% um, of the city were destroyed. And sadly today, I and mean, now we have uh, very current images of, of uh, these type of this destructions in cities uh, in our minds too. On um, international aid, for reconstruction was organized by the United Nations and um, Poland, for instance, in initiated a competition for the building of a new museum of contemporary art. Um, and one of the participating architects was Oskar Hansen, who didn't win uh, the competition, but he had submitted the most creative proposal for a new museum, a building that had flexible and movable structures. It could react to the art that was shown. So it could go up and down basically um, in height. And these type of honeycomb hexagon shapes were cut into triangles. And yeah, well, they could they could move along these uh, pipes or pillars. Uh, at least that was the idea and that was the concept. Um, and yeah, there was. It was not only about a museum. There were also other uh, proposals and big master plans for the rebuilding of the city center. This was a model, this kind of utopian uh, way of architecture that was, um, yeah, the, the thing to do in that time of the of the sixties uh, was by Kenzo Tange. I'm, I'm not really sure. A Japanese uh, architecture uh, architect. Who, uh, who worked on that. So I think many things, yeah, went into these considerations. Um, and uh, the earthquake as a seismic shift, um, Oskar Hansen's museum that, um, yeah, that was never built. Um, all this played a big part in, um, in what, was, what was coming after in this case. For me, it was a foundation of a, of a story background um, because um, later, um, for some Macedonian artists, I I worked on a project that they, that they were or had had a, had started um, about this museum by Oskar Hansen that was never built. So it was a project that followed the idea of a fictive museum and the program of the artists that would have been shown in that museum and what what basically the question it, it followed the question what would have happened if that museum would have existed um and i designed a little book for them a catalog a book uh, on on this concept and on the story and in this book there was a question leading through the whole book, book or appearing once again. So what, what if you don't know about something? Um, it doesn't mean it does not exist. So there's more than we see and we know. And um, what I find so interesting also when I go back to these, these ideas is that we see these utopian architectural ideas and plans um, here that were they, they look like spaceships or or, or international space stations uh, up in the in the universe and and uh, in the same time people might not want to live in these structures either so um oscar hansen if i go back to him was really um known for his open form theory who um who really tried to implement um i think people and, and humans into the architecture and uh, thinking about flexible structures that, that could adjust to humans' needs um, for whatever use they had for architecture. So there was a real museum built after all. It was not Oskar Hansen's. It was um, finally built in 1969 by two Polish architects. It is still there today. Uh, it's a modernistic building of the era, of the, the style of the time. And the collection that the museum um, or of the museum was put together um, entirely by solidary acts of international artists at the time after the earthquake. So artists and galleries basically donated artworks um, and the collection of the museum was built. So it opened in 1970 and um, 
in 2020 was its 50th birthday and I was asked to design a new logo for that museum because yeah we kept contact um, with the people in Skopje and that's how this came along and what struck me is the uh, apparent anachronism in the in the city because We've seen the utopian um, ideas and uh, models, and also some of them were built. Um, and then, in the same time, we see in or we saw in 2014, um, there was a huge building project taking place where classicistic or classicist monuments were kind of re-erected, um, remembering a history that never happened. Um, so Skopje never had these type of buildings that you see on the big photograph here. There were never these white pillars. Um, it's all um, styrofoam put on top of um, communist, uh, brutalist buildings. and. Uh, in some parts, they had even stopped uh, these construction processes because they were running out of money. So it's like, it's it's just really funny in in a way, and also very, um, I don't know, in a philosophical way. I think it's really interesting to see all these different layers of time in that city happening, and it, it's so much of a fictive story um, of different people that have things to say in the city um, that that happened there and everybody puts their layer on the city and mm, I think this is really inspiring um, uh, when function and reality blur and histories are made memories are made and um, none of them necessarily correspond to truth and um, this was Basically, let me see, maybe I clicked the wrong way. Um, this was a design that follows this whole um, input I received um, over the years. So there's still some shaking in this new logo, um, reminding of an earthquake and maybe of all kinds of shakings that happen nowadays in the world. And this M, yeah, for museum can can make space, but it's also, yeah, it's movable. And uh, um, it's a little bit, a, a tiny little hint towards Oscar Hansen, even though he never won the competition for the museum. So I also deliberately uh, reference basically ideas that have nothing to do with the actual um, mo uh, actual design of the museum today or with the architecture. So if they, if they could put and uh, throw things together, I can do as well. Um, and yeah, so th that's the way this, um, or, or that, in that way it happened and, and this logo came came along for, yeah, at, in the beginning it was a 50 years, anniversary uh, logo for the museum to to celebrate these 50 years uh, of existence um, and of the donations of the artworks and um, and then later on after a while or after that year basically it became um, without the 50 it became the new logo of the museum um, and yeah it, it also relies or reflects a little bit of the architecture in the museum which is it is really nice it's run down but it's an, it's 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 an interesting architecture with a lot of light and and glass and and there are yeah the same type of weird disruptions in in in, in shapes and diagonals uh, in the logo as are in the architecture and then you know uh, one could write stuff in between the, the parts of the logo and there is a typeface designed uh, for the Latin and the Cyrillics, the small letters are missing here. Well, I I just continue. And yeah, it it, it can be taken apart, this, this type of uh, a little bit modular uh, type design can always be taken apart. You can play with it a lot um, for kids or all kinds of other applications and um yeah i want to come back to 
to the why uh, again because um, the question maybe still stands um, but I think there for me there is one one because uh, I am doing this because when I was a kid I really enjoyed hanging out in my father's workshop where he worked as an industrial designer and he would build little models uh, of watches interiors for museums and or lamps and he let me shoot with an air gun into the walls of his studio under the roof and I would often basically just hang out there and uh, when he was working and he let me draw uh, on the wall directly and um, I still remember doing that and uh, maybe this is where it all began and and why it began, because the importance and natural act of drawing and in that sense also of, I think, design and art um, uh, is something that, yeah, in my opinion, was nurtured or my experience was nurtured and allowed everywhere around the house. And I think that's my why. And um, time being time, I think that's it. And I'm done. Thank you. And I will stop sharing right away if I find the right window for it which is on the other screen thank you for listening in the meantime until I manage to stop this what an amazing treat Ariane wow thank you oh my god it's it's just an wow wow the work is I mean I I just love loved every single moment and I'm gonna break protocol and maybe and to your issue of faces, Ariane, the Fucht, you know, the penultimate project you showed. Whoever wants, let's keep this informal. Uh, whoever wants sure. to show their face, please do, you know, on, 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 on um, how do you say it, the button, just, you know, show your faces. We're gonna, uh, I'm gonna break the rules by whoever wants to ask questions, maybe just go for it. And instead of doing it via chat, we can just have a conversation about some of Ariane's work. I, I can start with a question, but I don't wanna, I have a long list of <laughs> questions, but I, I don't wanna take up other people's time and I'm, I'm aware we're you know, slightly over um, over time. One thing you, you've you said many incredible things, Ariane, and I've been taking notes of, of, of lots of stuff. One thing that really uh, struck me was, uh, I think you said I was looking for something for a long time. And yeah. then, while you were at doing the internship at uh, with Stefan Sagemeister in New York, you said something clicked, right? And, and, and mm. it was like, and you actually eloquently said it was like a light switch that you know mm. was clicked on. What exactly is it for you that clicked? And you know, I, I think some of it is apparent in your work. And 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 I'm just going to liaise it with another question, just being slightly being greedy. Um, what advice do you have for any young designer that might be listening uh, today that either wants to apply for their first ever job in a design studio or is thinking about opening their own studio? Because there's one thing you said in an interview that is it's so important to pick the right place for yourself in, as the mm. first job, right? So yeah. what's your wisdom on that? And, and also about yeah, me. I think this, this last quote of myself, <laughs> um, <laughs> goes probably together with the with the first question this uh when when you feel something clicked and uh it, it was the way the way i started to talk this that um in design school i mean we, we we had all kinds of you know different lessons on typography or or layout more i think it was more it was either layouts or it was type design and and that was like two different things that the way i received them was not super exciting but that always includes myself I didn't know any better and maybe there, there was some something missing that pointed me in the right direction or but this when I talk about clicking there is something that um I don't know that 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 touches you where it 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 touches a sense of humor a sense of engagement a sense of passion even though that sounds a bit uh, banal but it, it is something that you really feel it, is it interest or are you interested in it enough to to really uh to to want this and there's there are so many things that you could try and you could do and it's okay but then there are things where you all all of a sudden you feel like wow this is really fun and i do you know i would work on it the whole night and that's that's this tiny little difference and 
I think with Stefan's work that was at the time for me in Berlin, having studied a few years, that was at that moment in time, beginning of 2000s, that was the thing that I, I was a totally ignorant student. I did not look around. I had no idea about other designers' names. I really knew nothing. I was kind of focused on my own thing and I did drawings. I did a lot of drawings. I thought I would become an artist. And I kind of really liked design, but I didn't really know where to find the fun in it um, and the this kind of joyful process that is really, I don't know, that, that really um, validates it for me. Um, and I think that that was something that happened there. It was not, I, mean, I was there a short time and it was this, uh, this one uh, thing with these, with these clothes that was, yeah, okay, just take them and just put dirt on them and you can do what, or, or that was not, I was not told that, but it was basically just do with them whatever you want. And we just need to have this kind of this sentence at the end uh, as a result. That was this, this, this task to do. And it's like, and it, I think in art school, I would have never dared to do this because it was so superficial <laughs> to just do something fun with type it was not really allowed you know in art schools often you have to be very conceptual and I think that's really great because to be conceptual and to be thinking before you do something is really good and it's really important but in when you are in a certain phase in your life as a student for instance you also have to 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 test and to figure out and to learn how to let go and how to do something that's real fun because otherwise you never get into the moment and into the process where you can let things happen because you just tried them out and if it's forbidden to do something because it's maybe too stupid then that's a bad thing i think so never anything stupid should be forbidden and uh, faking bird shit on a coat should not be forbidden as it was in this one so but it's like maybe I just exp or, or or thought it was forbidden it's like I don't even want to point fingers it's like you know you're always everybody runs around with their own ideas of how things work and how institutions work and uh, I can't really tell even if it if it was just me or if it was the art school I, I can't say but so yeah so that's I think that's the that's the light switch the kind of lightness to it as well, which I needed. And opening your own studio and applying to the right studio. I mean, you never know, you never know. Some studios might look really great and then they're really assholes, so you never know. But I think you can only depend on the work or, or rely on the work that you see that the studio brings out. And if that looks appealing to you and it lo looks interesting, then that's that's the places to apply for, and I think it's really good to be uh, to be working in a studio for a while, even if you, for instance, want to be on your own later. I think that's really worth a lot. I just did this one, and then later I I wanted to be independent and, and open my own studio. But I think that's you amazing, can. That's amazing, Ariane. Because how how did that work? Because you know you need clients in order to have your. Own yeah, you need clients. Place. I mean, like work, yeah. like studying in art school. Uh, not only this, since it was an art school that had art and design and all kinds of uh, departments in the same school, it was a kind of smaller school in Berlin. Um, it made us all really connected. So I I found already clients in art school. You know, the best is go for artists that later. You know do exhibitions or, or bigger projects or whatever. So, so basically I kind of dragged a few um, clients with me, but also since I went back to Berlin uh, at that moment in time, it was so much easier in Berlin to make a living with much, much less money. So that, that kind of wasn't even a reason for me to go back to Berlin partly because I knew I did not have to continue to work in the studio. I could do it on my own because I could afford it. So yeah. Yeah. That, that that was one reason. Um, so I can't even give advice on on you know nowadays uh, situations because it was just different then. Um, it was it was easier to to have just one or two jobs uh, for a month uh, or two months coming up uh, because it didn't matter so much. Um, so it's kind of a luxury luxury situation. Um, yeah, but, but other than that, also, it's much easier nowadays to get your work out, you know, on, on all the social media channels. So that was, that was much, much harder back then. I remember uh, I wanted to 
to find, or I thought maybe I should try to find work, at least freelance work with another design studio. And I didn't find even studios in that uh, in that time because they didn't have websites. So it's, it was the completely other end of the of the scope of visibility online. Absolutely, and, uh, but sometimes that not knowingness or not having those tools available, like making your you know your work known to a wider audience. I, 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 it's hard to asset. say. Maybe it took longer. I think it took longer. Definitely. I think. I think chances are maybe better today if you do it right. But it's also it's it's as always. It's more pressure as well. I mean, you have to stand out against all these other ones. So, but I, I I think it's 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 a good opportunity to be able to take it in your own hands um, and put your work out much much easier. Yeah. So if you want to, if, if anyone wants to be independent and start out as independent, sure, go for it. It's, I think it's absolutely, totally possible immediately. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. I think it does help to, 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 to keep the overheads low. I'm, 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 I'm going to shut up now because I have so many other questions, Maria, and just in case somebody else <laughs> wants to go. My answer was also a little bit, a little bit long. <laughs> Anyone has anything to ask? Just um, go for it. And if not, I shall proceed with one last question, Ariane, for you. I don't see any hands up. Okay. Can I, I'm going to go, okay? If somebody wants to ask something. Oh yeah, there's a hand. Lauren. Hi, I don't really have a question necessarily, but your work is amazing. I really like um, the, the the free flow of ink and um, it's just how you got people to interact with your artwork. And I just love how everyone's all individual and they have their own style and expressions. I know it's just, quite inspiring. Thank you. Julia. Uh... Hello, hi. Uh, thank hi. you. Uh, I was just going to ask, what was the most important thing you learned during art school? During art school? Well, never rely on anyone, just on yourself. <laughs> For some reason, I think that's um, that's the most important thing. I mean, like, and and I, and I think I was quite uh, happy um, that we I didn't uh, study in an art school where we had these star professors. It was more like you know just some designers, some artists that teach there, and I think that was a really good thing. So there was not so much about ego and about these very individual um, ego identities. It was really, they were taking themselves a little bit back and uh, sometimes they just left us alone. And I, I just figured out that all initiatives that you do yourself or with fellow students, friends, colleagues, that were the most important ones that meant the most for the, the later part, you know, for, for after the study. So I think that this own initiative, I think that would that would be the most important thing. But that's where you learn. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Simona. Uh, hey, uh, I wanted to thank you for the talk and we've seen uh, that we, you have many books as a background and we wanted to ask uh, what what was the one that really inspired you or you loved the most? Something that oh you God, would recommend to a enough. student? <gasps> what question is that? I have to turn around now. Oh my God, this is, um, uh, I can't, I can't, I'm not that. Well, I just got... Hmm. my memory is really bad about all these books this is there are so many good ones that you can't ask this question this is uh this is kind of mean um let me come back to that i think i have to say and this is a little bit about um a, another designer as well actually and it's a bit it's it's a very serious topic um but it's it's the first time that i've recently been to um 
to Amsterdam and actually for the first time I visited the Anna, Anna Frank house um, and I came across the, the, it was just a catalog for the, for the house, you know, the, the, the Jewish girl from the Holocaust and her diary. And, and um, I was totally, I looked at it and I thought, wow, that's an interesting book um, the way it's designed. And of course it was by a famous designer. It was by Irma Bohm. Um, and it was the first time that I really, um, if I show you, that I really read a catalog through from the beginning and end, because you always could unfold pages and you could find stories hidden inside. Um, and yeah, I was, I was really amazed by that it worked because usually I would go into the museum, I buy a catalog and then I never look at it again. And, and this time I really did and I really read it as well. So um, something really worked there. It's not, the most inspiring book, but it's something that was really recent and really catch my attention. <laughs> Maybe something else comes up and I write it into the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's a competition, Ariane, with your background in between your background and the people I see on my screen and Hugh Miller, whose background is also very packed with <laughs> books. <laughs> this, this thing. Uh, Spencer, do you want to go next? Yeah, hi. Um, what was the most valuable mistake you made as a young designer? Valuable mistake, a valuable mistake. Um, there were also just really bad mistakes. Um, yeah, there's one. I mean, it's very technical, but I really learned from it. And since then I don't do it anymore. And it was printing blacks on uncoated paper and trying to, brin to print an 80% black and 100% black and it doesn't work because it's the same black. <laughs> so never do that. <laughs> so that was, that was a, yeah, a little bit boring, but very valuable mistake I did in a technical sense, if you ever want to print something. Thank you, I'll bear that in mind. <laughs> that's, that's great advice. Ariane, I'm gonna, there's no more uh, hands raised. I'm just gonna wrap it up with one thing you said, and uh, I don't wanna put words in your mouth that you haven't said, but it's written, it's online, it's published. So I grabbed it from there. It's a beautiful quote that you, uh, a sentence that you said in an interview. I'm just gonna read it out loud because it, 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 it brings back a lot, some of the things you mentioned like curiosity and imagination, which are at, at, at the heart of what we do as designers, right? And you said, I could sit in a, in a cinema and watch uh, six hours of Jonas Mika's diary films without mm. getting bored or tired. I believe that everything we see and everything that touches us shapes our way of thinking and feeds into our idea of making in, in, in some way. Even if you follow creative strategies from a book, it's you that ultimately decides at the end for one idea or another, and there is a reason behind it which I think it's just so beautiful because us, you know, we filter things and, 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 and it just speaks about curiosity, curio how important it is to be curious as a, and, and I think you said it during the, the talk, Ariane, it opens, it's a springboard for the imagination, right? And I, I just thought it was very, very beautiful. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember that, I mean, like, I think we all also like ex more experienced designers, we all have these moments where we doubt everything and you question yourself and the idea is not com coming. I mean, it's just, it just belongs to the job. And I think that's, it's also sometimes good to remember these, uh, these things that there is an inner thing, an inner compass, an inner direction that makes you select um, the good from, from not so good, the interesting from boring. And I think that is uh, this, to some extent individual and it depends also on your sense of humor, your upbringing, the stories you grew up with. And uh, like that's, that's the way that how preferences are shaped. And I think that's like, we all are in that sense individual and can rely somehow on our individual preferences and uh, and tastes as well and I think that's I think that's really important to remember even for myself sometimes though that it's kind of a way of trusting your gut feeling uh, which is still even though we want to be so rational about everything an important part of design as well absolutely thank you thank you so much Ariane for your time and and thanks many thanks everyone for joining Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak forever. And uh, <laughs> thank you for listening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.